Welcome everyone to the third annual Multicultural Math Spaces Gallery Walkthrough, renamed this year for obvious reasons, the Virtual Gallery Lookthrough. While we miss being together in person, as we were the last two years in the warm havens of 179 Grace Dodge Hall and Macy Art Gallery, we are happy to bond virtually and safely. This is our third year hosting this event. There is a saying that when something is done three times, it is a chazaka. It is chazak, strong, meaning set in stone. So with this third convocation, we are creating a teacher's college tradition, a beautiful collaboration between the students of mathematics and multicultural education in the program of mathematics at MST and the Office of Diversity and Community Affairs. You're all in for an adventure. Prepare yourselves to be enlightened and be ready to expand your knowledge and perspective of mathematical spaces. You have an opportunity today to go on a journey with our students as they share their multicultural math spaces. Before we begin the presentation portion of our program, a bit of orientation is in order. What is a math space and why are math spaces important? A math space is any space, physical or virtual, where mathematics, learning, socialization and identity development occurs. One of the major goals of hosting this event is to jumpstart your interest in engaging and crafting intentional spaces for mathematics learning. To say we are in challenging times is an understatement as we combat COVID-19 and attempt to cure our social and economic inequities. Mathematics has come front and center, exponential growth, inflection points, flattening the curve have become household terms. Mathematics relevance and ubiquity is evident more than ever. And as mathematics educators, we have an obligation, a responsibility, and an opportunity to reimagine how mathematics is taught and viewed. The year 2020 is certainly a year when students stopped asking, when will we use math? And started noticing its applications in the basic functions of life. It is a critical time to make mathematics education a cultural imperative a necessity for social and economic progress. Let's be real here. How many of you have felt disconnected from mathematics at some point in your education? How many times have you heard the statement, math isn't my thing, I don't have a math brain? The field of mathematics has a reputation for being exclusive and abstract. Yet mathematics is a collective human endeavor. Mathematics isn't brain specific, gender specific, race specific, ethnic specific, or SES specific. Mathematical thinking is at the heart of every culture, and there are vibrant histories of mathematical discoveries across the continents. A few such examples are the Mayans in the Americas, the Hindus, the Chinese in Asia, the Yalnagu in Australia, the Yoruba south of the Sahara Desert in Africa, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks in Europe, going back millennia. Mathematics was and is fundamental in the buildings of civilizations, intricately woven in the fabrics of the arts and architecture, pivotal in play and games, and essential in science. Axiom one, everyone can engage deeply in mathematics. Axiom two, we are all mathematical. Axiom three, mathematics is all around us. I would like to share with you a story about the photo shown here. Several years ago at my hooding ceremony, which took place in Lincoln Center, my advisor and another close professor were having a conversation with my sons who were wearing yarmulkes with a design that consisted of mathematical symbols and objects. Upon examining the yarmulke, my advisor said, hey, look, there's a spherical triangle and there is a Mobius band and matrix multiplication. Hey, this is a non-Euclidean, non-orientable, non-commutative yarmulke. This led to a rich discussion of these fun topics. My children were learning about triangles that have angle sum larger than pi. They were learning about two-dimensional spaces that have only one side where orientation is not preserved. What happened there was that a multicultural math space was organically formed by the presence of a yarmulke. Mathematics learning can truly happen anywhere and everywhere. Multicultural mathematics learning is the perspective of teaching and learning for learners of all backgrounds with an equitable focus on students from underrepresented demographics. 
Multicultural mathematics learning is about eliminating a tracked system that is a breeding ground for discrimination while having high expectations and, math and making mathematics relevant to all students, focusing on enrichment over remediation. In this program, we will hear from the chair of MST and director of UMI, Dr. Erica Walker, a pioneer in shining the light on mathematical spaces in the world around us and making math accessible to all students. We will also hear a few words from a pillar in our community, Vice President of Diversity and Community Affairs, Janice Robinson. Then for the highlight of our program, we will hear from our wonderful student presenters, 10 Math Chavrusa partners in MSTM 5020, who will showcase their chosen multicultural math spaces. Sit back, relax, and be amazed. Hello, I want to thank Dr. Flint for inviting me to join you for just a few moments to talk about mathematical spaces. I'm Erica Walker, and I've been intrigued by mathematics for a long time, ever since I was a little girl. In my research here at Teachers College, where I'm a mathematics education professor, I explore social and cultural factors that influence mathematics participation, engagement, and performance. I found that many people, children and adults alike, have very fond mathematical memories that are centered on place. Our colleagues in literacy research have explored similar questions, and there are many popular liter literacy spaces that are public, invitational, and that many researchers analyze. Over the last several years, I've found myself thinking about mathematical spaces akin to these literacy spaces. My working definition of mathematical spaces includes these tenets. There are sites where mathematics knowledge is shared and developed. There are sites where induction into a particular community of mathematics doers occurs. And there are sites where relationships or interactions contribute to the development of a strong mathematics identity. So these don't have to be physical spaces, but like tonight's program, include virtual spaces as well. Any place where someone is doing mathematics or sharing mathematical knowledge. I've written a few papers and book chapters about these ideas, and I'm happy to share them if you reach out to me. I'm so pleased that Dr. Flint has continued this tradition, even in a pandemic. I look forward to seeing all the mathematical spaces that our students have created and found, and learning with and from all of you. Hello, I'm Janice Robinson, Vice President for Diversity and Community Affairs at Teachers College and Associate Professor in Higher Education. This is the third annual Multicultural Math Spaces program, a collaboration with Dr. Rocky Flint, a beloved colleague and active collaborator with our office at the college. Though we are not in person, the core goals of the program remain the same, to inspire attendees to view math spaces as a space for diverse identity development and understand that we are surrounded by math spaces in our day-to-day -day lives. The program showcases innovation, inclusion, through a multicultural mathematical lens. The work led by my office is framed around reminding the institution to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion matters in deep and broad ways. Courses like MST 5020 and this annual community-wide engagement in multicultural math spaces are key to that vision of a deeper application of DEI across the college and the disciplines. It's a pleasure and an honor to continue to celebrate our dedicated, talented, and innovative students. I hope that you have enjoyed their contributions to the field and to the college as much as I have. Thank you to the students and a very special thank you to Dr. Flint for her thoughtful and inclusive pedagogy. She continues to build community here at Teachers College. Thank you. Imagine you are in a room and you are suddenly encompassed by the sounds of low harmonic throat singing behind the chanting of prayers and mantras with the intermittent sounds of horns, drums, bells, cymbals, and trumpets. These sounds are coming from Buddhist monks clad in crimson and saffron colored robes wearing yellow galupa hats. At the conclusion of the opening ceremony, four monks spread around a square table and begin sketching what seems to be a series of lines and circles. 
Using chalk, pencils, compasses, rulers, and string, the monks spend hours meticulously marking the table to create a well-developed blueprint-like figure. Small bowls of various colored sands are placed along the edge of the table alongside small ridged copper funnels and scrapers called chalk bores. The monks begin to scoop the sand with the funnel, move to the center of the sketch, and carefully scrape the funnel in order to slowly release the sand onto the surface of the table. The monks spend days diligently working from the inside out, carefully releasing little bits of sand from the chalk bores in an effort to complete their colorful design. After, after several weeks, a beautifully curated design lays in front of you. Your eyes are drawn to the circular pattern at the center, surrounded by various squares, lines, shapes, and images of deities. Now that the image has been completed, chants and prayers fill the room once again. The beautiful arrangement is slowly swept away in a ritualistic manner, brushing the sand toward the center of the table until it all becomes gray. The sand is then carefully collected in a pot wrapped in silk, and carried out in a procession to a nearby flowing body of water where it is released back to nature. The process just described is the creation of a sand mandala, which is unique to Tibetan Buddhist culture. These designs are made up of geometric patterns that represent the universe as well as three-dimensional sacred Buddhist structures in a two-dimensional space. The Tibetan monks can spend up to three years training to become skilled in this intricate and meditative art form. Both the creation and dismantling of the sand mandalas have significance to the monks, symbolizing enlightenment and the impermanence of all that exists. Clearly, this process is highly spiritual for the monks. However, there are many mathematical properties that are involved throughout the creation. Although the mathematics in mandala creation may be secondary, the intense precision, focus, and persistence that the monks exhibit highlight the relevant mathematical practices. Since the meditative process is the focus, it is likely that the Tibetan monks don't necessarily view themselves as mathematics doers. However, mathematics certainly exists. The mandala itself, along with the use of compasses and rulers, highlight the geometric aspects that are very much present in this math space. Some geometric properties that are seen in the creation of sand mandalas are measurement, proportions, and symmetry. In measurement, area and circumference are used to construct the center circle, as well as measurement of the straight lines that make up the rest of the blueprint. For example, compasses are used to create the perfect circles and rulers help ensure that the lines for the outline are accurate and precise. Proportions play a critical role since the monks must take an image from memory and accurately draw the intricate patterns and designs to a larger scale. Symmetry is a crucial aspect of the mandala and is only prevalent when the measurements and proportions are exact. Mandalas can have reflectional symmetry, meaning it produces a mirror image when cut in half, as well as rotational symmetry, meaning the image looks the same after some rotation. Mandala's reflection of so many different geometric concepts is a perfect example of how often multiple mathematical properties work in unison in the real world, something that is not always apparent within the mathematics classroom. Since the mathematical properties in sand mandalas may not be obvious at first glance, when used in the classroom, they can provide more entry points for students into the mathematics discussion and pique students' interest causing them to view mathematics in a more positive light. Whether sand mandalas are used as a central theme to a unit or a project that guides the curriculum, they can help students make connections between mathematical concepts and highlight how mathematics is prevalent outside the classroom, thus emphasizing that mathematics can be exciting and is seen in so much of our daily lives and culture. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation on sand mandalas as multicultural math spaces. I'm Alex Polgini. And I'm Isabel Matthew. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Emma LaPlace. And I am Brittany Kilgore. And today we're going to be talking about board game cafes as multicultural mathematical learning spaces. Alrighty, so we would like to mention our image right here, which is a tabletop board game cafe in Cleveland, Ohio.
So the first question I would like to pose to the audience is, what is a multicultural math space? Well, a multicultural math space is a place where there's equitable space that inspires math learning of people of all genders, races, classism, uh, disability, all of the different critical issues that exist in society, which is non-traditional, which allows it to be in a space other than a classroom or a school building. So we also might wonder how are board games mathematical because we might not necessarily think of them as that. Um, so like math, board games have a set of rules and guidelines that you should be following. And um, in terms of younger children, they can help to improve number sense. So there was a study done about two games, Candyland and Shoots and Ladders, which I'm sure many of us have played. Um, and Candyland uses colors to tell you where to move your piece and Shoots and Ladders uses numbers to tell you where to move your piece. So results actually showed in these studies that shoots and ladders um, help to improve number sense and numerical skills and reasoning for preschool age children. So that's how board games can help younger kids with math. But how about people who are older, maybe even out of school? Um, you might think of chess as being mathematical, which is um, a somewhat obvious example with its problem solving, logic, strategy, probability, but actually a lot of board games involve those critical math skills. Um, and the game set, which you may or may not have heard of, um, introduces some more complex mathematical concepts, set theory, for example, which in math is um, informally collections of objects. And it also introduces the mathematical concept of combinatorics, which is an area of math which is concerned with counting. And even deeper into math learning, um, there are some current day mathematicians who are still trying to prove uh, they're writing proofs about the mathematics involved in the game set. So clearly, lots of board games have different ways of um, introducing mathematical learning for learners of all ages. Wow, Emma, seems like I need to move to Cleveland, Ohio to get some mathematical practice. So it says, how, let's think about it. How is a board game cafe multi multicultural? Well, it's a space that allows all ages, genders, um, class, races to all get together and practice these mathematical strategies, practice these skills. And as you can see, for example, there's a Black Lives Matter a flag handy, uh, holding up in the panel of the window. And then you have a LGBTQ flag um, that is accepting space for all members of the community, regardless of your preferences of sexuality, race, class, or gender. And furthermore, oftentimes in a classroom, students feel a lot of pressure to perform well in front of their teachers and peers. And it can be um, somewhat nerve wracking sometimes to engage in mathematics in a, in a classroom setting. This board game cafe provides an informal, relaxed social environment for mathematics discourse to occur between friends as you're eating and drinking, playing a board game, talking about your strategy. Um, you can also have the opportunity to work with people who you might not be in a class with. Maybe they're in a different grade than you. Um, maybe you guys aren't even in school, but in a classroom, you're with the same people every day. In a board game cafe, each time you go, you can have a new um, group of mathematical peers to engage with. Um, it provides a space of healthy competition, um, doing mathematics while drinking, talking, eating, and having a good time. Yeah, this was a great choice for a mathematical space. And we really enjoy you all coming out and analyzing this mathematical space for us. And hopefully in your community, there's a place where you can notice mathematical spaces to increase the skills and practices of mathematics. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Danielle. And I'm Katie. And we're going to be discussing Peg and Cat, Accessible School Mathematics Through Television. Peg and Cat is a public broadcasting or PBS television series intended for children ages three to five. The image shown comes from the episode The Chicken Problem, season one, episode one. It, the show centers on solving a really big problem using math concepts. Mm -hmm. The physical layout of this PBS show offers a space for young children to visually see different mathematical symbols and concepts that will reappear in the later years of their formal mathematical schooling.
The background of the grass and the sky are made with grid paper. The flowers on the bottom right are made with division symbols and the clouds in the sky are created with infinity signs. By subtly including these more advanced mathematical operations and symbols, children are exposed, likely for the first time, to school level mathematics. Peg and Kat teaches skills delineated by the standards of NCTM and the Common Core. Problems are inquiry-based and contextualized within the show. In the image, Peg is exploring the number of chickens found in comparison to the number missing, after chickens escape from the coop. We see the numbers 1 through 10, as the 10 chickens in the cage are counted, and Peg says those numbers aloud, relating the name of the number to its symbol, quantity, cardinality, through a concrete representation. Once 10 chickens are moved into the coop, Peg still needs to find the rest to get to 100, demonstrating the difference counting up method. The idea of size and quantity is used to support pro proportional understanding. Once these 10 chickens are in the coop, the rest of the 100 chickens are shown and Peg discusses how 10 is very little compared to 100. This concept is a through line throughout the episode. Characters even sing, little goes with little, and big with big. The characters model resilience, critical in the development of a growth mindset for students. In the image, we see Peg saying, now we just have to get them pausing. This is aiding children in developing grit in their problem solving and situates math as something that is not ability-based, but instead effort-based. It counters the deficit perspective that can be detrimental to oppressed groups by suggesting that achievement is not predefined by nature. However, this idea can be dangerous when not paired with regard for the myth of meritocracy. Effort may not be enough for perceived success due to systemic challenges faced by various groups. This show meshes math and leisure spaces, showing that math is not reserved for the experts, but can even be done by a young child. Peg and Kat strategically structures their brand to be accessible to a large array of young children. Each episode is 11 minutes, which is the appropriate length uh, that allows children to stay entertained without becoming bored or distracted. Closed captioning is available and helpful for children who are hard of hearing and as a tool to aid reading. All of the episodes are free on their YouTube channel and website, and the website is easy to use, child-friendly, and has printable activities and worksheets. To look at Peg and Kat through a multicultural lens, we can focus on the main character, Peg. Peg is a female, which defies the stereotypes of mathematicians being mostly male. However, she is a white child, which is consistent with the general stereotype of mathematicians being Caucasian. While Peg has many friends on the show that do represent racial and gender diversity, it feels slightly inauthentic. Each of the, of the characters, regardless of race and background, talk the same, sing the same, and act relatively similar. Peg and Cat is a fun and educational math space outside of the classroom for ages for children ages three to five. While the areas of diversity and multicultural can be approved upon, the show has successfully created a space in which young children can see themselves as mathematicians. Welcome everyone to our math space presentation titled A Space Within a Space. My name is Chandra Mongru. And my name is Fritz Prophet, and I want to begin by talking about our space itself. Um, our math space consists of the black and white tiles that you see in front of you, um, black squares and white octagons. Now, we overlaid in that space Pascal's triangle, as you can see with the red numbers, the triangular pattern. Um, now, Pascal's triangle itself has tons of mathematical wonders, which we thought would be interesting to overlay over our space, hence the title of space within a space. Now, we use the term Pascal triangle very loosely because we understand that, um, that tr this triangle was discovered centuries before Blaise Pascal laid eyes on it. As a matter of fact, it's referred to by other names in other countries. In China, it is called Tianghui's triangle, and in Iran, it is called Kayam's triangle. Next, we will give several mathematical concepts that exist in Pascal's triangle. Firstly, observe the green annotation here on the left. We consider different exponents of base 11, and notice that there is a correlation to what they evaluate to. Insofar as 11 to the 0 is the first power, 11 to the first power is 11, 11 to the second power is 121. Another mathematical concept to consider is what we've annotated in purple here. Notice if we consider different exponents of base two, 
This can be considered the sum of the numbers in each row of Pascal's triangle. Namely, 2 to the 0 is 1. 2 to the 1st would be 1 plus 1, giving us 2. The sum of 1 plus 2 plus 1 will give us 4. And the sum of 1, 3, 3, and 1 will give us 8. A another mathematical concept to consider is that of the hockey stick identity. We have drawn these figures here for you in yellow. The numbers along the handle here of the hockey stick, namely 1, 4, and 10, will sum to the tip of the hockey stick here, which would be 15. Notice that this phenomenon also exists on the right hand here. Now, one of the coolest things about math spaces and the space sense in particular is that, well, in general, math spaces are really accessible to students. We really just need creativity um, in order to identify these spaces. Um, so, as we are currently experiencing a pandemic, our curiosity led us to this space in our homes. Um, these are just bathroom tiles. So we're hoping that all students, anyone who's interested in mathematics, will use their creativity and diligence and find other math spaces in their orbit. Thank you Thank for you. listening. Thank you very much. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle DeAngelis. I'm a student, a master's student in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching at Teachers College, and I'm also a fourth grade teacher at a New York City public school. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Gao, and I'm also a master's student in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching at Teachers College. Um, and we're very excited to be here today virtually to share with you our math space for the Math Spaces Project. Um, our math space is one that's a common site for anyone who's been in New York City uh, during the summer months, especially. Um, and especially, it's a, it's a popular site to see during the summer months in the uh, Latinx neighborhoods of Uptown Manhattan and the Bronx. Um, during the summer months, it's an incredibly common thing to see uh, groups, especially of Latino men, playing dominoes on street corners and empty lots. And um, what's so remarkable about these games is that they kind of take on the feel of like a street party. There's a lot of like music and laughter, cheering and jeering, um, food and music. And um, it's really this rich sort of um, community building experience, uh, unifying experience for, um, you know, the people in these neighborhoods coming together uh, around uh, this game, which, as Eric will tell us, is, is a very mathematically rich game. Mm -hmm. And while we might not think of things outside the mathematics classrooms as necessarily mathematically rich, Dominoes, in fact, is an example of a very mathematically rich um, concept. So in order to understand why, I'm going to shortly discuss um, the rules and consequences of dominoes. So um, dominoes is often played as a scoring game where players compete against each other by trying to maximize their own score. And while the rules um, of dominoes varies based on location, and in fact, you know, anyone can define their own rules, um, Following the procedures of a game like dominoes introduces players to concepts like algorithms and theorems. And in addition, dominoes requires quick mental math in order for players to decide what they want to play, but also requires deep mathematical strategy in order for players to decide how they want to try to win. Um, finally, while dominoes itself, because the game is based on matching a finite set of um, dominoes together, is combinatorial in nature, um, one can imagine that the layouts, the sprawling layouts of dominoes on the board is deeply geometrical. So really, while dominoes is not in the classroom, it asks its players to think mathematically on several different mathematical axes. Yeah, and as Eric alluded there, uh, a lot of the mathematics that are happening in dominoes, we would consider those to be um, like hidden mathematical concepts. They're not mathematical concepts that are uh, super explicit. They're really sort of like um, below the surface. And so we would we conjecture as we, as we think about how people in this mathematical space see themselves as doers of mathematics, we conjecture that um, the people in the space, player dominoes players, especially players with street dominoes, 
Um, they're not really thinking of themselves as doers of mathematics when they're in these spaces. And we think that that's actually really troubling. And it, it really connects to uh, what we consider to be <clears throat> the sort of like um, barrier between everyday mathematics that people experience in their everyday lives and school mathematics, which tends to be very sort of like rote and procedural and top down. And as we all know, it can be very alienating for a lot of students, especially students from minoritized backgrounds. Um, and so for that reason, we think that the Game of Dominoes has a lot to teach uh, mathematics educators about the practice of teaching mathematics. Exactly. And to sort of summarize our point, we think that the introduction of games like Dominoes to mathematical classrooms might, might help to make math less exclusive, more free-flowing, and more egalitarian for all. So thank you for listening to our presentation, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Hi, so I'm Brenna Decker. I am in the MA for Mathematics Education program, and this is my first semester at TC. I'm Panayata Chattis. I'm also in the MA for Mathematics Education, and this is my first semester here at TC as well. Okay, and let's get started. So a mathematical space can be defined as any idea that can aid in mathematical learning through inorganic or structured means. And though this definition can feel vague, it only expands what can be done um, to be considered mathematical learning. And our chosen space, for this presentation is a sunflower with a Fibonacci spiral displayed on it. Um, and this space is very tangible because it's such a common flower that many students would recognize and it makes for an excellent multicultural math space um, because despite its commonality, it also has complex mathematical concepts that can be introduced to students by using these real world tangible objects. So the picture that we chose to represent our mathematical space, as Brenna said, is this single picture of a sunflower. Everyone has probably come across a sunflower at some point in their lives. Sunflowers bloom throughout the summer and early fall. They can be found in gardens, fields, and farms, and are usually sought out for the stereotypical summer picture. But sunflowers are so much more than being the subject of just a pretty photograph. In fact, part of what makes them so pleasing to the eye are the mathematical concepts present in these flowers. And though they're beautiful, there is a plethora of mathematical learning and exploring that can be done here. The two major concepts demonstrated in this mathematical space is the Fibonacci spiral and the golden ratio. The Fibonacci spiral is a spiral that represents the Fibonacci sequence. And the, sp the spiral itself consists of squares of Fibonacci numbers and then quarter circles and repeated creates this spiral structure. The Fibonacci sequence is important to mathematics because by taking any number in the sequence and dividing it by the previous number, uh, the golden ratio is obtained. These concepts are important, to, are important mathematical ideas that have a lot of influence on our natural world. Such as with the sunflower, the Fibonacci spiral is seen all over nature in a variety of trees, flowers, and other plants. In our mathematical space, the spiral is an explanation of the pattern of the florets of the sunflower. In the sunflower, the florets form two spirals, one going clockwise and the other counterclockwise. If we follow these spirals to the edge of the sunflower, we will obtain pairs of numbers that are directly from the Fibonacci sequence. And although it is important to acknowledge the actual mathematics taking place within our math space, um, it is even more important to acknowledge how people can become doers of mathematics within this space. This space in particular may be one that is more difficult for the non-mathematician to acknowledge the mathematics occurring. Um, however, this doesn't mean they can't participate in mathematical learning within this space. A botanist or even recreational gardener may not recognize the exact definitions of Fibonacci sequence or golden ratio. But even if they're just observing the spiral pattern, they are actively contributing to the mathematical learning that can occur here. And since mathematics occurs so organically in nature, this gives a lot of evidence to the statement that mathematics is for everyone. So the sunflower itself creates a space in which anyone can participate in and learn mathematics as it is easily accessible. Bringing this learning experience into the classroom will allow students to make connections between mathematics and nature. This can help students view math as an important aspect in their daily lives. 
Sunflowers also can be used to debate the question, is mathematics created or discovered? Since nature has been working in a mathematical manner since its inception, math can be considered as existing and waiting to be discovered. A discussion of Fibonacci numbers can also lead to recognizing and understanding patterns in a sequence of numbers, which can be very useful in mathematics. Lastly, teachers can ask students how the golden ratio can be applied in their daily lives. Questions such as, can this be useful when trying to pack a suitcase, can help students to think about and explore these applications. Although sunflowers may not seem to have mathematical qualities at first glance, it is now evident that they serve as a useful mathematical space. Though the sunflower shows us complex ideas of the Fibonacci sequence, spirals, and the golden ratio, it is an approachable introduction to these concepts. From a multicultural perspective, using a flower to approach the complexity of the Fibonacci numbers would make the mathematical concepts much more tangible to both students and other math doers. Hi, this is Jiaqing and Chen, and we're going to share about our math space. Uh, when Jiaqing and I discussed our multicultural background and uh, the understanding of uh, a mathematical space, it was realized that there are a lot of uh, similar experiences in us uh, because both of us are international students. Uh, one of those is, uh, you know, both of us, we used to work for an or in our career during our uh, freshman year. As you can see, this is a photo taken from an ice cream shop. Right. That's, you know what? Actually, I found a lot of mathematical thinking in this space. Oh, really? Yeah, for example, in another class, uh, I'm asking to design a PBL task for some high school students. And uh, so that like, I ask the students to play roles of uh, employees who is working in an ice cream uh, store, just like this. And uh, they might need to confront with some uh, like questions from customer. For example, uh, they will ask like how many ways they can three flavors from 20 different flavors of the ice cream uh, in total and to fill a ball that can hold five spoons of the ice cream at most at the same time. Wow, that's a multiple choosing and combination question. Correct, it is. It's cool. Actually, I have another experience that I want to share. You know, when I just came to the U.S. and worked for the ice cream shop, I could only speak real English. It brought me a bunch of challenge. See, once a customer purchased ice cream, they will check out. I need to do some calculation for the goods. When I hear two numbers in Chinese, the image of the numbers will quickly come to my mind and I will calculate it quickly and report it. The entire process will be finished in just a moment and even without any thinking. However, when those two numbers were coming up with English, the situation would be different. It was hard to directly come up with an image of those numbers in my mind. Instead, I need to translate them into Chinese first and recognize who they are. Sometimes I even need to write them down. After calculated, I need to translate it back to English and report it. The entire process will spend a very long time and sometimes make me look like a person who have a math learning disability. Right, actually I'm in this situation as well when I'm working there. Uh, so do you feel better right now? Yes, I practice is a lot in the ice cream shop and now I feel more comfortable with doing English number calculation. Great, that's very interesting. And I think this is also another reason why we have this math space. Uh, additionally, I think, you know, this space is open to all students and everyone could go to, you know, any ice cream sh shop. So all of them could bring their math here to this space and put their math thinking. So I hope you guys could really enjoy this space. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So my name is Wen. My name is Brandon. And the two of us are two students in the math education program doing our initial certification in secondary math. 
Uh, we are also, and this brings us to our music space, our math space, um, musically trained students who um, I studied many years of piano. And I studied many years on the xylophone. Exactly. So the two of us share lots of passion of music and math. And therefore, the, mu the math space that we chose is what we call also music space, where it is a music score. Uh, so the reason why we chose this topic, other than obviously being passionate ourselves, is because we see so many connections between music and math, even though it might not be what many people think. Um, we see music and math being connected on every single level of your music studies and all your math student studies. So for example, one very obvious um, to us um, place where we can see these connections is as early as in elementary education where in math we are teaching the students fractions. So in music, fractions becomes what we call these objects of, uh, of the length of the notes. So we have, for example, a unit note in music, a whole note, and all the other notes are just some fractions respect to the unit and whole note. We have a half note, we have a quarter note, and all these notes follow also the addition and subtraction rules of fractions. So adding to half notes will get you a whole note. Um, so as early as in elementary, you could teach math using music, and you can also teach music using math. So how we do we teach music as we move forward? Uh, and there's so many ways of doing it, and Brandon will show you some other ways as how we see music and how we see math. Um, as Wen and I were talking about our music experiences and our math experiences, we came to the joint conclusion that we were lucky to have such a formal music education. Um, and in talking, we realized not all of our students, and in some cases, none of our students will have formal music education as part of their elementary and secondary curriculum. So for us speaking about quarter notes and eighth notes and things relating to simple and complex time signatures are very accessible, but that's not accessible for a lot of our students. Yet we know that music has this mathematics-centered focus. How can we link these two together? Um, one thing that a lot of students have in common, obviously, is that they listen to music in an informal sense. On their walk home, on their subway ride home, they will may hear it, you know, mom or dad listening to music, or they might hear it as they're walking on the street. You know, every student that we see will have some type of a musical experience. And if we can bring that musical experience into our classroom and in turn bring our math outside the classroom, I think it would be very mutually beneficial. Um, I think we can all relate to, you know, anticipating your favorite part of a song coming up. Um, you're able to predict it after repetition. This sounds like building up a data set and then making predictions on it in probability. Or after listening to a bunch of different songs by a particular artist, you might understand the underlying patterns of their music. There's a lot of patterns that go on in our math classrooms as well. So music and math are very intertwined in a formal as well as an informal sense, which brings us to you know, our concluding remark that music and math are not nearly as far apart as we think they are. Uh, music is considered one side of the brain, math the other, but in reality, they're far more intertwined than we often consider. James Joseph Sylvester, a 19th century mathematician, liked to say, the musician feels mathematics. The mathematician thinks music. Music, the dream. Mathematics, the working life. Neither of us could have said it better. Music and math are two sides of the same coin. So whether it be a math space or a music space, we can use either to create a mathematically sound classroom. That's all the time we have today. Very nice speaking with you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Juliette Zisplat. And I'm Jenny Stakiva, and this is our math space. As you can tell, it's on chess. But before we tell you about chess, let's tell you why we chose it. When Juliet and I were choosing our math space, we discussed the importance of a math space. Many students believe that the purpose of learning math is to be able to use the material in most career fields. 
Actually, mathematics offers many valuable life lessons. It teaches people how to think creatively, effectively, and just differently. Learning mathematics teaches an evolving mind how to analyze situations in various viewpoints. It is our task as educators to show students the purpose of learning mathematics is not only career oriented, but has effects on one's overall thought process. We, like all mathematicians, argue that mathematics surrounds us in our everyday lives. However, if math surrounds us on a daily basis, why is it believed that only math mathematics educators can teach the material. Lawyers, scientists, construction workers, grocery store clerks, everyone interacts with various types of math. We can learn from each other when we connect and collaborate on our expertise, usually through a common hobby. Hobbies are activities that interest people unrelated to their work, education, or any type of other category. These spaces in which hobbies take place are what we call math spaces. A math space is an accessible area in which an individual, no matter their race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, level of education, and more, can access and participate in the mathematical activities. We will be focusing and discussing one hobby in specific, chess. Chess is a strategic game that uses probability, geometry, problem solving skills, procedural fluency, and more. Most famously, Washington Square Park is known for its stationary chess boards from the 1994 movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. Um, these boards are actually implemented in 1940s when street chess became popular. Since then, more of these spaces have been developed in parks all over the city. Um, some space, some parks don't have stationary boards just like Washington Square Park does, but it is likely to see chess players sitting on crates bringing their own boards in parks. Um, and even in Washington Square Parks, players of all levels of experience and knowledge can play together for $5 per two games. We argue that this space not only encourages mathematics education, but also social and identity development. According to the famous deve developmental psychologist, Eric Erickson, Identity is developed through social interactions. Chess spaces promote interactions between people of common interest, regardless of any differences in the characterizations between them. Participants, no matter the level of readiness, can play with different genders, ages, religions, nationalities, races, education levels, and so on. Throughout the game, opponents are able to converse about their lives, share cultures, beliefs, and ideas. These social interactions with people unlike oneself create an environment where minds can be opened, opinions can be changed, and identities can be developed. So with this math space that we have identified, we can take our thinking, our understanding to a deeper level when we include the idea of equity into the conversation. In a more general sense, we're going to be looking at the intersection of equity and mathematics. More specifically for our math space, we're going to ask ourselves the question, what are the inequities that we should be considering? Because to fully understand the ways in which a particular space is equitable, you must start out thinking about the ways in which it is not. The first step in creating a change and fixing the problems that something might have would be identifying what those problems are. So let's start by talking about the most quote unquote typical math space that there is to talk about. In a high school or middle school classroom, for example, things such as access to out-of-school support, general opportunities to further one's knowledge of content or bolster one's understanding of a topic, even the availability and convenience of obtaining proper learning materials, such as notebooks and pencils, are merely a couple of the aspects to consider when thinking about how equitable a math space is. And while all of these different things that I listed are not necessarily all in-school privileges, right? Some of these privileges can be found outside of school or outside of the classroom. The availability and access that one has to these different opportunities can change how an individual experiences the communal mathematics space that they're a part of. So now that we've gotten a small setup into the way that we've analyzed our own math space, let's dive right into it. Looking at this math space, Jenny and I were instantly able to pinpoint various equitable features that we wanted to discuss. Putting individual skill level aside, in terms of the game of chess itself, both players are provided with the same pieces 
and given the same amount of time to make moves on the board. In this particular space in both Central Park and Washington Square Park, everyone has the opportunity to take a lesson with the chess master, as Jenny mentioned before. While certain chess tutors, as they might be called, charge a very hefty price for private lessons, in Washington Square Park specifically, anyone can take a chess lesson for the price of $5. And at the end of the day, the only dependent variable would be the individual player themselves playing the game. So whether you're motivated by competition or simply motivated to perfect your strategy, this math space proves to be an equitable option for any and every player. A final feature of this math space that we decided to look at is its practicality. How can chess be seen as a space that supports multicultural learning? Throughout this entire course, our understanding of multicultural education has changed greatly. Arguably, the most relevant point that we have taken from our learning is that education does not solely occur in the classroom. Learning, exploring, inquiring, challenging, and theorizing can happen anywhere. Not only do we view our chess space as a communal environment in which everyone can become a member of, but moreover, we view it as multicultural. There is no specific type of person that you associate with the game of chess. There is no specific religion, nor ethnicity, nor race that you associate with the game. Simply put, these chess spaces are melting pots of individuals from anywhere and everywhere. We believe that this space not only promotes socialization and proves to be equitable, but this space promotes multicultural learning and overall personal development. So as we conclude our discussion on the math space that we've identified, we encourage you to continue thinking about the other spaces that you have come across. And we challenge you to include equity in your next conversation as we all work towards creating spaces where mathematics can flourish. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Michelle. Hey, I'm Nina. We're both students in the Initial Certification Program in Secondary Mathematics Education. Today, we're going to be talking about the art piece Metronome. This is a three panel installation on Union Square South. We're gonna be focusing on the leftmost panel called The Passage. Now this is a large 15 digit LED clock that was initially designed by the artists Kristen Jones and Andrew Ginzel. And the seven leftmost digits are meant to represent the time as it currently is in military time, hours, minutes, seconds, tenths of seconds. The left, uh, the right hand seven digits represent the time until midnight in reverse, so tenths of seconds, seconds, minutes, and then hours. The digit in the middle is hundredths of a second, and it flashes by so quickly that the human eye can't really track it. Now, this is meant to represent the frenzied pace of life in New York City, as the entire piece is meant to represent the nature of time. Uh, so with this clock metronome, even though it has one pretty standard meaning throughout most of its history has had a couple different meanings over time. In 2005, it was converted to be an Olympics countdown clock uh, to count down the time until the host city of the 2012 Olympics was announced since New York City itself was in the running. When that change happened, people thought it was counting down to the end of summer, till the end of the world, lots of different interpretations. Uh, likewise, the clock was changed again for a week in 2020 to be a climate counter. This was meant to count down the amount of time until it was projected that the global temperature would raise by 1.5 degrees Celsius, largely considered to be the time at which we have passed the point of no return. Uh, even though there have been these three kind of separate, discrete meanings over the years, people have come up with their own interpretations throughout the clock's history. People have thought it is anything from a viral marketing campaign for the movie Lo uh, for the TV show Lost to a counter of how much Amazon rainforest is left. One person was quoted as walking by it, thinking it, it meant the digits of pi, though corrected himself when he realized, quote, wait, why is it moving? Uh, realizing that pi should be constant. Yeah, so I think that's a great example, both of the multiple interpretations aspect of this uh, mathematics space um, and also the opportunities for mathematics learning along the way. So some of the um, analysis that we brought in our paper was that it's an opportunity to introduce the base 60 numerical system. Time is really a numerical system, just like our uh, base 10 numerical system, but we could talk about the base 60 system, how it works, how it came from the Babylonians, and how different cultures can actually come up with different approaches to even the basic um, parts of math, like our numerical system. The hundredth of a second digit is a fractional value that makes something precise. Precision is important when we teach mathematics in the classroom, but maybe it's not that useful. Maybe precision becomes less important when we think about something that can go so fast 
fast that the eye can't even register it. The symmetry of the clock is another example that um, finds its place in geometry. And so these opportunities for math learning can also tra translate to um, the passers-by, the New Yorkers who see this and begin to transform into mathematics doers in this multicultural space. Um, so as they go, as Michelle said, they're speculating about what this number means. They're hypothesizing their own theories about what it could mean, and they're making sense of it, reckoning with how the number fits into their daily life as they walk by. I think the climate clock in particular offers this opportunity for mathematics doers to become global citizens, to be conscious of the pressing issues that surround us, both in New York City and beyond. Um, as one uh, climate clock creator uh, put it, this is a countdown, but also uh, an explanation that the world is counting on us. Um, so metronome is sort of a physical embodiment of the kind of multicultural math education that we're trying to implement in the classroom. So how can this be implemented in the classroom best? Our thought was that one of the best things that you can do for students is to take them on a field trip to metronome so they can experience and interact with the piece on their own in the space and come up with their own unique interpretations. This can lead to a rich classroom discussion of every student's own unique interpretation because each student is going to have their views of the piece be informed by their own unique cultural, mathematical, and life background. Uh, this piece can allow students to really understand and experience that math is in the world all around them, not just something that's learned in the classroom and then forgotten about, but is something that interacts not only with the spaces they move through every day, but with their real life important issues that they're reckoning with as global citizens. Uh, lastly, it allows students to understand the connections between mathematics and art, see the underlying creativity in math, see how multiple interpretations and multiple approaches can all be valuable in the mathematics classroom. Thanks so much for listening to our presentation. Thank you. Wow, mathematics is really everywhere. There are lots of fun and games and intricate structures we can find in so many of the spaces of our lives. We just experienced a rich array of creative and thought-provoking mathematical spaces and heard profound insights. So in reality, we are always in a mathematical space. Bravo to our wonderful presenters in MSTM 5020. Thank you. And many thanks to Dr. Walker and many thanks to Vice President Janice Robinson and a huge shout out to the Director of Diversity, Community and Equity, Juan Carlos Reyes and the Office of Diversity and Community Affairs for your unwavering support. And thank you to all of you for joining us here today. Now we invite you to embark on your own journeys and to start formulating your own multicultural math spaces. Looking forward to the day that we will be reunited in the safe havens of Teachers College. Stay safe and happy holidays.